There was once a great Trojan prince called Aeneas at the royal house of Troy, which had two branches. The oldest of those of the house of Dardanoi, of Dardinia, and the second, the house of Troy, which became the most powerful and the most famous. Aeneas's father, Anixes, was of the city of Dardinia, and his mother was Aphrodite, making him a powerful demigod, and his grandson, Tros, eventually lent his name to the city of Troy. When Troy fell, Aeneas fought heroically, and he was saved from death by the gods more than once. But eventually, he was forced to escape. Carrying his aged father, Anxes, on his back, he led the Trojan survivors into exile. After a long time of wandering, they moved to Italy, where they settled and were the progenitors of the great Roman Empire. Aeneas had a son called Ascanius, who in turn had a son. Ascanius asked a sorcerer what his son would be. What would he do? What did the future hold? The sorcerer said, Your son will be very well loved, a great man of many achievements, and he will rise to the highest honour. But I must warn you, his birth will be the cause of both of your deaths. Asenius couldn't stand the thought, and he killed the sorcerer. As predicted, Asenius' wife died, giving birth to Brutus. Brutus grew up into a strong young man, with never any indication that he was going to kill his father. However, one day whilst out hunting in the forest, tragedy struck again. As predicted, Brutus, instead of hitting his intended quarry, as the beaters drove out the deer, he accidentally shot his father. His relatives were incensed, and Brutus was grief-stricken. He was exiled at just 15 years of age. He went into exile in certain parts of Greece. And there he discovered the descendants of Helenus, Priam's son, who were held captive in the power of Pandrasus, the king of the Greeks. After the fall of Troy, Pyrrhus, the son of Achilles, had dragged this man Helenus off with him in chains, and a number of other Trojans too. He had ordered them to be kept in slavery, so that he might take vengeance on them for the death of his father, Achilles. Realising they were his ancestors, Brutus stayed with them, and soon his wisdom, military skill and valiant nature was very apparent to them. They flocked to the hills, emboldened to flee their captivity, and begged Brutus to be their leader, their descendant returned to rule. Brutus eventually agreed, and, allying with a local half-Trojan prince, Asaracus, whose fully Greek brother had turned the Greek king against him, tried to deny him his rightful inheritance of three castles. These castles they fortified. Brutus decided to give King Pandrasus fair warning, a letter requesting that the Trojans be allowed to live free and at peace in the hills. However, Pandrasus ignored this olive branch. With the king's men out hunting for them, they attacked, killing many, many Greeks in the first wave. After much fighting between the two, Brutus came up with a plan to storm Pandrasus' castle at night, convincing one of Pandrasus' own men, his brother Anacletus, to deceive him through threat of violence. The Trojans stormed Pandrasus' camp with Brutus himself taking the king hostage. They threatened to take his life, indeed to take it slowly and painfully, if he did not free the Trojans. King Pandrasus spoke thus, since the gods are hostile to me and have delivered me and my brother Anacletus into your hands, I must obey your command. For if you meet with a refusal, we shall both lose our lives. I consider that there is nothing better or more enjoyable than life itself. It is not, therefore, to be wondered at it, for I am willing to purchase life with my material possessions. He even promised to give Brutus his daughter in marriage which he did not mind at all, seeing as Brutus was an accomplished young man. Brutus was given ships and all kinds of grain, gold and silver for his men, and Ignoge, Pandrasus' daughter, who wept and wept on the voyage away from her relations, but Brutus was kind and made every effort to console her. After two days and one night, they touched at a land called Neogesia, 
which had remained uninhabited since it was laid waste by a piratical attack in ancient times. There they hunted. They came to a deserted city and found a temple of Diana. In the city there was a statue of the goddess which gave answers if by chance it was questioned by anyone. Brutus went with twelve men to perform a sacrifice to Diana, Jupiter and Mercury and poured libations to all. Brutus stood before the altar of the goddess, holding in his right hand a vessel full of sacrificial wine mixed with the blood of a white hind, and with his face upturned towards the statue of Godhead, he broke the silence with these words. O oh, powerful goddess, terror of the forest glades, yet hope of the wild woodlands, you who have the power to go into orbit through the airy heavens and the halls of hell, pronounce a judgment which concerns the earth. Tell me which lands you wish us to inhabit. Tell me of a safe dwelling place where I am to worship you down the ages, and where to the chanting of maidens I shall dedicate temples to you. This he said nine times. Four times he proceeded round the altar, pouring the wine which he held upon the sacrificial hearse. Then he lay down on the skin of a hind which he had stretched before the altar. Having sought slumber, he at length fell asleep. It was then, about the third hour of the night, when mortal beings succumbed to the sweetest rest. It seemed to him that the goddess stood before him and spoke these words to him. Brutus, beyond the setting of the sun, past the realms of Gaul, there lies an island in the sea, once occupied by giants. It is now empty and ready for your folk. Down the years, this will prove an abode suited to you and to your people, and for your descendants it will be a second Troy. A race of kings will be born there from your stock, and the round circle of the whole earth will be subject to them. Brutus and his men sailed the world looking for an island and found many other places, engaging in more great battles, suffering pirate attacks, and hard times without food or water, but eventually acquiring many riches. Eventually, they came to the island that at that time was called Albion, and it was very beautiful, with many trees, rivers which teemed with fish, and all the Trojans wished to live there, but it also had giants, huge and ugly creatures. The Trojans soon drove these into the hills and caves with their weapons and their skill, and in time, the island began to look as if it had always been this way. Brutus named it Britain, after himself, and so the people Britons, and the language British. Corinius, one of Brutus's best men, called his park Cornwall. There were a lot of giants in Cornwall, but that bothered Corinius not one bit. He loved to wrestle with them. Among the others, there was a particularly repulsive one, called Gog Magog, who was 12 feet tall. He was so strong that once he had given it a shake, he could tear up an oak tree as though it were a hazel wand. Once when Brutus was celebrating a day dedicated to the gods in the port where he had landed, this creature along with 20 other giants attacked him and killed a great number of the Britons. However, the Britons finally gathered together from round and about and overcame the giants and slew them all except one, Gog Magog. Brutus ordered that he alone should be kept alive, for he wanted to see a wrestling match between this giant and Corinius. Corinius was of course delighted. He girded himself up, threw off his armor, and challenged Gog Magog to a wrestling match. The contest began. Corinius moved in. So did the giant. Each of them caught the other in a hold by twining his arms around him and the air vibrated with their panting breath. Gog Magog gripped Corinius with all his might and broke three of his ribs, two on the right side and one on the left. Corinius then summoned all his strength for he was infuriated by what had happened. He heaved Gog Magog up onto his shoulders and running as fast as he could under the weight, he hurried off to the nearby coast. He clambered up to the top of the mighty cliff, shook himself free of this deadly monster whom he was carrying on his shoulders, and hurled him far out to sea. The giant fell onto a sharp reef of rocks, 
where he was dashed into a thousand fragments and stained the waters with his blood. The place took its name from the fact that the giant was hurled down there, and it is still called Gog Magog's Leap to this day. And that is why there are no giants in Britain. Britain, 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 Britain.